Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rodney Sobin at NASIO. Uh, we're going to um, start in just a moment or so. Uh, there are people still uh, logging in and calling in, so um, we'll give it another minute. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning to anyone who's tuning in from Hawaii, Alaska, or the Pacific Territories. Uh, welcome to today's webinar of the NASIO NARUC Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings Working Group with the inelegant acronym GEB for Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings. Uh, we will have the webinar today with three great presenters on grid interactive appliances. Next slide, please, Ed. Uh, but first, uh, before we get started, we'll uh, have a little bit on uh, logistics. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm not sure why it's not displaying. Hold on one second. Technical difficulties. Okay, we will try again. Technology. If the slideshow doesn't work, Ed, uh, maybe just scroll through these until we get to the main event. So I did want to go over a little bit of logistics. Uh, all the attendees are in mute mode right now. And uh, we will have a Q&A session after the speakers have uh, spoken. Please use the question box on the right side of your go-to meeting. And I see that there's already a chat item. Um, okay. So uh, please uh, use the uh, go to webinar question box to uh, to ask questions. We also have a raise hand mode, uh, which would allow you to be recognized and unmuted. So that is a possibility, but we do prefer the question box. The webinar is going is being recorded and the slides will be posted on the NASIO website under events and past webinars. We will also post them on the uh, NASIO GEB uh, working group web pages. Next slide, please. I do want to spend a couple of moments to talk about grid interactive efficient buildings. Uh, as uh, we know, advanced, advancing technologies are opening up more opportunities for flexible buildings and flexible load management to reduce costs, improve resilience, and also to reduce emissions. Uh, there are multiple benefits. Uh, the main questions are, how can we optimize facility interactions with the grid? How can states uh, create uh, policies, programs, and regulations to advance such optimization? And what are roles for states, facility operators, utilities, uh, energy service and products providers, and others to, to make that happen? To try to address these, uh, we at NASIO have been uh, very fortunate to be able to partner with our friends at NARUC, 
to create the state GAP working group. And we have been very fortunate to benefit from the Department of Energy's Building Technologies Office uh, support to do this. The working group uh, works to inform and support states on GAP and demand flexibility. We also have a component of uh, National Lab technical assistance offerings. Next slide, please. I do want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge Ed Carley, my uh, NASIO colleague uh, who's uh, behind the scenes making this all work and has been working with us on the uh, GEP work as well as broader buildings work. And also again, recognize our colleagues at NAWOC uh, for their partnership in this. Um, the working group currently has 17 states. If your state is not listed and you are interested, please let us know. We've been very fortunate to have Casey Radcliffe of the Oregon Department of Energy and Hannah Terwilliger of the Minnesota PUC staff uh, acting as uh, chairs of this group. Uh, let's get to uh, Ashley's slides and while, uh, no, Abby's slides, sorry, Abby's slides. Uh, let me take a moment to introduce our speakers today. Uh, Abigail Dakin manages the requirements for Energy Star heating, cooling, and water heating products, and the grid responsiveness of elements of all energy specifications. Before joining EPA in 2010, she has done research in physics and in sustainability. She has also worked in electronics design and worked on standards. She will be first up to bat. She will be followed by Ashley Armstrong, who is Director of Regulatory and Technology Policy at A.O. Smith Corporation. A.O. Smith is the largest uh, water heater manufacturer in the United States. She primarily works on regulatory and policy issues at local, state, and federal levels relating to energy efficiency, advanced technologies, sustainability, and water and hydronic heating. Prior to joining A.O. Smith, Ashley was supervisor at the U.S. Department of Energy in its Appliance Standards Program, where she was in charge of test procedure development for DOE's regulatory program, and also uh, with Energy Stars program's uh, test procedures. She has led certification, compliance, and enforcement testing programs, and she holds a Master's in Mechanical Engineering from Virginia Tech. Uh, after her will be Sarah Volpal of the uh, Washington State uh, Energy Office, which is housed in the Department of Commerce there. She is an energy senior energy policy specialist where she focuses on distributed energy resources. In the past year, she has supported the agency request uh, legislation at the Washington Department of Commerce, updating state appliance standards. And as you will hear, she is working uh, currently on implementing that law which includes the first in nation design requirement for electric storage water heaters. So let me hand it to Abby, thank you. Thanks Rodney. So uh, I'm here to talk about the uh, criteria in Energy Star product specifications that relate to grid communications and why we care about them and our strategy. So if you go to the next slide, I'm just going to start with why Energy Star, which is focused on energy efficiency, um, includes elements of grid communication. So um, the first part is the rise of IoT and smart technology, smart home technology. So this provides one opportunity for insight into the uh, into and control of energy use, but it also is part and parcel of the growing base load where connected devices, smart home devices, have um, some always on power that, that their non-connected compatriots don't necessarily have. A light bulb is a great example of that. And many of these are Energy Star products. And if there is an opportunity to uh, get the same or similar or better functionality with lower energy use, EPA's Energy Star program wants to be involved. Then at the same time, there are changing grid needs, and Rodney referred to this very briefly um, in talking about uh, GEBS, that efficiency, energy efficiency is still critical. There's still a strong role for the tr traditional Energy Star um, efficiency all the time role. But in addition, there's a rising importance of insight 
into and control of when loads will be, the grid will be carrying a load. And these are the two trends that have led us to uh, stay with the times as a premier uh, specification setting organization for demand side management. As demand side management evolves, so do our specifications. And what we talk about is we talk about connected criteria. And connected criteria, as I'll talk about in more detail, encompass both uh, grid communications and all of the other opportunities that uh, having something which communicates outside of the home offers. So if you go to the next slide, we've been doing this for a while. Um, we our first product uh, connected criteria was refrigerators. That was 2013. And in over time, as we came to do more of this and as the world's understanding evolved, what we found was that um, we reconsidered our strategy and came to a more comprehensive strategy which differentiates some products from other products. And I'm going to talk about that in detail. But what I want to mention is that all of this leads to one coherent vision of the future, which is our vision, but it's actually what we found in our smart home energy management system work is that our stakeholders shared this vision as well, which is that there would be a single touch point for utilities and third parties and homeowners to use to understand and control the energy use of their home and to optimize it for multiple possible values. Um, in the short term though, large loads like air conditioning and water heating in particular will remain worthwhile targets for load flexibility on their own. And so we put quite a bit of effort into looking at the demand response criteria for those products. So if you go to the next slide, this is the um, rethink, the product of our rethinking in 2018 was that some products are different from others. And in particular, if you look at the third column here, the thing that is going to pull um, connected, connected capabilities into the market for different products is different. So for those products on the top, pool pumps and water heaters, really the shifting of load doesn't affect consumers at all. And there's not a great deal of consumer interest in having these products connected. It's not something they're likely to play with. As long as the product works, they tend to ignore it. And so for those products, grid services, the ability to shift load is likely to be a primary driver of bringing connected versions into the marketplace. Products in the second um, the second row have those same properties, except that can, there's a, a lot more consumer interest in having connected for HVAC to be able to control your um, set point while you're not physically in the home. Obviously, that's been a very popular feature of third-party smart thermostats. Uh, and of course, for electric vehicle chargers to understand the state of charge at any time you need to. Then there's a that middle row, the primary value of, and this is really where we saw the connected criteria first was the white good appliances, the refrigerators, laundry, um, dishwashers. That's where it came in first. And there are some energy opportunities in terms of maintenance and operation saving energy. Um, and as well, the brand owners like to under, can use connectivity to understand how consumers use their products and therefore design better products. There is some value to the grid. It's not a great deal. Then there's a set of IoT products which are newly connected. Um, and those have been getting adopted because of consumer interest. And the consumer interest does have to do with energy efficiency, but that is not the primary interest as we found in our SHEMS work. And there, um, the primary opportunity we saw for connected was added load. And then as time went on, we realized that the opportunity to pull these together into a single smart home, you know, residential lighting 
it doesn't have a significant enough load for demand response, but a home in general does. And if the smart home system understands where loads are in that home and which ones can be delayed, then for the bottom three rows, that may come to provide significant insight and usefulness. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk about what we're doing for each of these groups of products. So appliances, we have a balanced approach which looks at energy savings, smart home integration, consumer convenience, and for some, particularly room air conditioners, grid services. Uh, there is a consumer amenity available now. Um, and we also hear, for instance, in the example of uh, dryer controls, that with the settings chosen for dryers have a significant impact on the energy use of dryers. And so there's an opportunity for the information that comes from connectivity to be used to recognize energy saving products in the future through better controls. Um, we have recently completed a test method for demand response of room air conditioners and uh, now have some of those on our list. And for these products, all of which have optional connected criteria, not all, the product doesn't have to have it to be Energy Star, the, um, we are revising these criteria as the energy efficiency criteria are revised, most recently for dryers. Next page. For large loads, this has been a lot of the work in 2020. So these are the loads for which uh, they represent a large enough load and a flexible enough load that there is value in uh, having them individually addressable for demand response in the short term. So the criteria we have been developing for these products or revising in the case of pool pumps and electric vehicle chargers really are focused on providing a reliable, stable, predictable resource to the grid. Um, so for instance, these criteria are being coordinated for interoperability as much as we find practical. For instance, with the proposed criteria for Energy Star Connected Water Heaters, a demand response system intended to work or set up to work with one Energy Star Connected Water Heater that uses a given protocol should work the same way with every Energy Star Connected Water Heater from any brand uh, that uses that communication protocol. So we currently have drafts for residential central AC and heat pumps in process that include connected criteria based on the HRI 1380 standard. Uh, also for residential water heaters, um, that uh, there is a draft out on the street and DOE is in the midst of developing a test method that shows under lab conditions a certain amount of load shift potential um, for the water heaters that will be recognized as Energy Star connected. And we expect to wrap that up pretty soon and hope that there'll be models certified and tested by the end of 2020. Electric vehicle chargers, we've just released the first draft of the updated connected criteria, which make the criteria much more specific and hopefully more useful to utilities. And we'll be launching a revision of the pool pump specification probably late in 2020. Next slide. Okay, and then we have a, a set of small loads which consumers are eagerly adopting. And in this case, our strategy really is to bring energy savings along for the ride. So the message is, you want all these cool smart home gadgets, you can use the Energy Star certification mark, you consumer, to guide you to the smart home gadgets or systems that are going to provide the best energy performance along with the other features that you're looking for. So in this case, what we've done is we do have connected criteria for lighting and for some other uh, products that we already um, that we already certified for energy performance. And those criteria really focus on integration into a smart home that pays attention to energy. So for instance, it requires that they self-report how much energy and or power they're using as an example of what we mean by integration into a smart home paying attention to energy. And then in 2019, we finalized the smart home energy management system specification, which uh, according to this philosophy, this uh, strategy, 
you should think of a smart home system with energy manage on, management capabilities rather than a system built for energy management that also provides some consumer control. Uh, we are we expect the first certifications in 2020. Like everything else, coronavirus has delayed that. And most of our work right now is working with partners to uh, figure out where they fit in the program and to uh, help them get their products certified. And I should mention that uh, Smart Home Energy Management System, or SHEMS, these are one of the two products for which we don't certify versions that are not connected. It's kind of a ridiculous idea for SHEMS, but for smart thermostats, it's not so ridiculous, or for thermostats. We only certify smart thermostats because for those products and for SHEMS, it is only through the data from users' homes that we have confidence that the product is saving energy. These are products where savings, they're controls, and savings for controls come from a complex interaction of the product's technical capabilities with the, um, with the uh, um, user behavior. And the only way to understand how that is resulting in energy use is through collecting data from users' homes. Now, we do not collect that data. That's data that the service providers already have. What we do is we ask for analyzed and aggregated versions of that data that give us a sense of across a large number of homes, how is the product being used? And that gives us information not about the home, which we don't want and don't need, but information instead about how the product and in general is used. If you go to the next slide. For other products, instead of uh, connectivity being required for the Energy Star product, the way it shows up is that we define what connected means for that product category. Products are certified to meet it, which may or may not involve a test for demand response, depending on the type of product it is. And then uh, on our qualified products list or a product finder, they show up as connected versions of that product. So as we go through our specs, what we're, one of the, the focuses in all specs is interoperability, which has um, significant advantages for utilities, for manufacturers, and for consumers. And we do this through uh, concentration on the encouragement, or in some cases, requiring open standards through, um, in the SHEM specification, we require uh, that the required devices in for that specification, the system automatically discovers them and connects them to the system and they can be controlled through the user, the app for the smart home system. Um, and in the most extreme cases for demand response by specifying for a particular protocol, this command means this product response. Next slide. And then we're also paying attention to the opportunities that Connectivities uh, provides, like demonstration of savings, as I talked about. Uh, we're exploring how to access energy savings through better installation, for instance, for um, heating and cooling products, that's a strong possibility. Um, and in most of our connected specifications, we include consumer alert criteria. So we're no, we don't specify what they are, but that the manufacturer must provide at least two energy related alerts to consumers. And these could be the fridge door is open, the furnace filter needs changing, et cetera. You can think of many other examples, I'm sure. Um, in terms of that, the holy grail really is that for water heaters and heating and cooling products where failure is usually the um, motivator to buy a new product and therefore it, it's bought on an emergency basis, what we'd really like to do is give consumers notice that their product is coming to the end of its life so that it would be possible both for consumers to conveniently schedule that service, but in addition for them to do research and to order products that are higher efficiency ahead of time. And I think that's the end of my slides, uh, except for a couple that I have for 
questions. Could you go forward and let's see if we're in backup slides? Ah, definitely worth noting, security. So this is IT security and data privacy are a big deal in the IoT world in particular. Um, I don't know that people think about that with water heaters, but certainly uh, for smart home they do. However, it's not an area of expertise at EPA. And what we do with things like this, which are safe, essentially it's like a safety concern. And we often include safety criteria in our specifications, but the way we do it is by referencing uh, generally accepted external standards where those standards are not uh, routinely followed. So for instance, electric vehicle chargers are a great example. There is a UL safety standard. There are many products on the market which do not follow that UL safety standard. So we felt both to protect consumers and to protect the meaning of the Energy Star mark, it was important to include that in our specification. And what we'd like to do with security is something like that. We haven't found a safety standard or an IT security standard that's at the same level of acceptance. So we continue to keep an eye on that. And I'll end there. Thank you very much, Abby. Um, just want to remind people the uh, question box is available um, for, for, for later after the other uh, presentations are done. So uh, I see someone has already availed themselves of that. So we'll look forward to that. Uh, Ashley, you're up to bat. Great, thank you. There you go. Perfect, you can go to the next slide. Great, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Armstrong, and I'm the Director of Regulatory and Technology Policy for AO Smith. As most of you are probably well aware, AO Smith is one of the world's leading manufacturers of residential and commercial water heating and hydronic heating equipment. We happen to also make water treatment and air purification products as well. I would like to first thank NASIO for organizing the webinar, as I'm excited to talk about grid interactive buildings and water heating. So as we all know, buildings are the nation's primary users of electricity. 74% of all US, all US electricity is consumed within buildings. As such, building owners and operatings, operators are seeking various ways to both reduce their utility bills, but also take advantage of times when pricing is low and or renewable generation is abundant. Smart water heaters can be a fle grid flexibility asset for those building owners to utilize. Smart water heaters are essentially conventional electric or heat pump water heaters that have additional sophisticated controls. Smart water heaters can simply allow a utility or a third party aggregator to control their energy use during the course of the day. Within a given local territory, a fleet of water heaters can be controlled altogether to be a flexible energy storage system that can then adjust the load on the grid. Everyone has a water heater in their house. Thus, it has been said that this is the least expensive form of energy storage that is available. Next slide, please. So the water heater advantage, kind of like why, why water heaters? Most consumers and commercial customers install their water heaters and never turn back. They kind of forget about them unless issues arise. With that, even with the implementation of a load management functionality within the water heater, it is very unlikely that a customer would notice that their water heater programming is being altered from their traditional use. Smart water heaters can be programmed to adjust the times when they are using power. For example, a water heater can be reheated to recover from the usage during the off-peak times or when renewable generation is abundant. Smart water heaters must have a balanced load. In other words, you must use the water heater in order to preheat it or shift the usage in order to have load to recover from. 
Next slide, please. So this just is a schematic of a heat pump water heater. Um, in spe more specifically, our grid connected heat pump water heater has high efficiency. It can be scheduled to heat from renewable energy sources or when prices are low, and it can provide grid flexibility. Some expected peak benefits of our heat pump water heater. So it gets about 0.2 kilowatts load reduction. It has about 1.5 kilowatt hours of storage twice a day. Um, and those are the numbers, as you can see there, for the electric resistance portion. Next slide, please. So these are just some water heating features. Um, for smart water heaters, you can you can put in more sophisticated electronic features. Um, com convenience features include remote controls, alerts, so you can do customer alerts when there's element failure, failure or if there's leak detection. In there, you can let the customer know that they have an issue with their water heater. You can also have energy features, which is like vacation mode or an energy smart algorithm, or it can say when it's grid connectivity ready. Um, more sophisticated versions can have certain time of use schedules placed on them, um, and they can run various operating protocols based on those time of use schedules. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, unlike a battery, water heating, uh, water storage essentially needs to balance. It needs to balance between the hot water demand so whatever the customer uses draw profile is, as well as the energy energy generation, which is the low cost of energy or low GHG emission energy generation. So there has to be there has to be some type of balance amongst the day with the usage, and when when that energy generation is happening. Next slide, please. So this is just one example schematic of kind of how this works for a water heater. Um, these are different layers of connectivity, but essentially you have a water heater that can talk to the consumer. So it's gonna have some type of consumer facing feature, whether that's through the app, um, through a website, it may have something on the water heater itself, but most commonly it's done through an app since most people use their phone for a lot these days. It then will, can talk to the um, utility through Wi-Fi or a different communication signal that is of the utility's choosing. Um, it can execute commands from the utility um, by sending specific codes to the water heater. Um, this can be either time of use pricing, it can be certain commands like load up and shed. It can also tell the water heater when there's a grid emergency so that the water heater doesn't turn on when the grid just can't handle anything else. Next um, slide. So I kind of just um, talked about a couple of the water heating commands that are typical, but one of the things that there's a standards body, um, basically CTA standard 2045, that's working towards both a common hardware protocol as well as a common communications protocol, such that when you get certain commands from any utility, the water heater would then know what it meant. Um, we participate pretty actively, and most of our water heaters can be ordered with a CTA 2045 port if they are going to be used as a smart water heater. But essentially, it has show shed load and critical peak commands. It also has load up commands when you want the water heater to start um, heating up for times when either you have renewable energy generation and, and or low pricing. And then, as I mentioned, it can tell when there's been a grid overload or there's an a grid emergency and it turns the heater completely off. So basically it can actively communicate with a water heater during the course of a day. Next slide. So um, about, a, I would say, two years ago now, we participated with Bonneville Power Administration in a pretty large scale pilot of CTA 2045 water heaters. And there was a variety of different products involved um, and, and they had two primary objectives with that study. And one was to run DR events, so actually install a fleet of smart water heaters that had these CTA 2045 ports 
and modules that allowed them to actively communicate with a water heater. And then they wanted to see if they ran a set of demand response functions, kind of what happened. And they also wanted to see from this, could they then make a business case to require um, CTA 2045 ports, which allow for communication, um, could they make a business case proposal to justify the cost of adding those? Next slide, please. And, and this shows just some of the summary results that they found. Um, you know, obviously the report has a lot of good information in it, but generally speaking, they use both electric resistance and heat pump water heaters, and they ran it through the winter and the summer. And you see a summer here of both two hour energy shifts. So they asked to shed load for two hours and four hour energy shifts to shed load for four hours. And you can see the power that was able, able to be shaped from the peak, as well as the amount of energy and watt hours that was able to be shifted on either the two hour or four hour period. Next slide, please. So just kind of in summary, um, a lot, of, a lot of emphasis is being placed on smart water heating these days. Um, when combined with battery store, storage, the return on investment is improved because smaller batteries are required. It has the potential for $9 billion per year in avoided utility cost. It can have up to $172 per water heater per year utility benefit. And in the BPA pilot, what we found is there actually was a pretty high level of consumer acceptance um, for both the customer and grid benefits. So it was a net positive for both. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there was a lot of smart water heating activities going on. Um, we're seeing smart water heating requirements, um, pilots, programs, kind of incentives and rebates. Um, increasing as part of various states and localities decarbonization policies. Um, one of the things I think that's most important for manufacturers is that as these policies or programs come online, that the technical requirements must be harmonized. And that's really important because manufacturers really only want to make a single product that it can sell across state boundaries and they do that because they want to achieve scale with a variety of components and ultimately reduce cost. So we know there are various states adopting um, demand response requirements. I'm not going to talk in detail because I think we're about to hear from someone that is, but Washington and Oregon and we're, we've seen California also adopt some, some requirements in Title 24, their building codes around that space. Abby just mentioned that Energy Star is, is considering connector criteria for water heaters, and the Northeast or Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance Advanced Water Heating Specification also now has a requirement for a CTA 2045 port. So as these activities continue to flourish, um, we would like to continue to see those technical requirements be harmonized and work together on them. Next slide. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. That was great. Um, we will move on to Sarah, who th there was a nice segue there to uh, application of this and uh, regulatory and, and, and law policy aspects. And Sarah will tell us quite a bit about that. Yeah, great. Um, and actually, while you're getting set up, I do want to thank Abigail and Ashley for setting me up so nicely to talk about the work we've been doing here in Washington State. Um, and awesome, thank you. And, uh, you know, just that there's this highly technical aspect to all this policy and regulation. So having kind of this broad coalition of people supporting this conversation is really critical, which I will be talking about a bit more. So yeah, I'm going to dive into the grid ready water heater standard that is uh, first in nation and now part of Washington state law. So if we go to the next slide. So I work at the Department of Commerce and um, it's, uh, it's in the state energy office inside the Department of Commerce. And within that, there is a lot of different things that we do, um, not only energy, but also, you know, working on um, kind of housing infrastructure and other community services so we just um have a very broad purview and it's 
actually really exciting to be able to work on something that has so many um, benefits like grid connected water heaters. So if we go to the next slide, I'll jump in and talk a little bit about the actual law. So uh, standards in Washington state, state standards were first established in 2005 um, and amended again in 2006 and 2009. And then we, we took a break for quite a while, um, so much so but by the time we came back to amend these uh, standards, every single one had been preempted. So um, it made my editing job easy, but yeah, it was clearly time for an upgrade. And, you know, a lot of this came on the heels of the work by the Appliance Standards Awareness Project. Um, so our uh, Commerce had a piece of agency request legislation. Um, it was originally part of a larger clean building standard that also passed in 2019 and is very exciting, but realized that it needed its own um, kind of specific amount of stakeholdering and policy work um, because at the end of the day, you have 17 standards in there that have 17, you know, at minimum 17 different interested parties. So it was really important to kind of take that out. Um, so when I started at Commerce, they gave me this bill to kind of work on um, and provide technical support to. So yeah, as I mentioned, we used the ASAP base bill um, and then included the water heater standard. So if we go to the next slide. So that bill passed um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the details on that, but uh, in part of um, implementing, we're also updating our administrative code, which includes deleting all those old products I mentioned, as well as adding all these new ones. So 17 new products, including this water heater uh, design requirement. And, um, you know, we also have the authority to update administrative and enforcement sections. So our, Washington, our administrative code includes sort of testing and certification provisions. Really, that's already in the bill, kind of repeating those. But, um, you know, explaining implementation dates, including labeling and listing requirements, um, some work on a penalty provision. And then there was also a lot of work in kind of figuring out the implementation date for the water heater because it was first in nation. Um, and one thing I'll mention is that the way we do these standards is really to reference, in general, Washington is sort of a fast follower um, behind folks like California. Um, so we tend to want to reference things that already exist, usually like Energy Star or um, CEC. But, you know, so this is a brand new territory for us. It's been very exciting. Okay, so if we go to the next slide. So the uh, design requirement for electric storage water heaters applies to uh, 40 to 120 uh, gallon tanks um, for electric storage water heaters um, and with an input rating of 12 kilowatts or less. And then as I mentioned, a big chunk of the work was really on this um, implementation date. So original implementation date in the bill was January 1st, 2021. We had a very um, uh, kind of intensive stakeholder process that I was uh, that was very interesting and really important for this brand new standard for us. Um, you know, I'd also mention that the commerce has not really been in the business of doing standards, as you can tell from our, you know, had been since 2009 um, that we sort of had even looked at standards as a, as a state. So, you know, it was really um, important for us to understand sort of the technical aspects of this. And we had you know, manufacturers, utilities, environmental advocates, and as well as um, the water heater manufacturers. You know, folks showed up from all over when we could still do that. Um, and we had, uh, I think, three or four in-person meetings um, about this. And so we only ultimately came to was that, um, you know, we delayed the implementation for electric resistance water heaters to January 1st, 2022. Really just to give folks, it was, we were convinced that, you know, there was some time that was needed to kind of figure out the right solution that would fit this standard for Washington State. But, you know, the hope there is that once they're figured out for Washington State, and if we're harmonizing these standards, really, you know, they should, the manufacturer should be ready to go. So that's really exciting. I do want to note that um, that January 1st, 2021 standard, excuse me, implementation date, um, Commerce is considering doing some rulemaking on pushing that back by six months. Um, we've gotten some letter, a letter from manufacturers uh, requesting 
um, you know, or just um, explaining the kind of difficulties around COVID and supply streams with this new product they're making. So um, we'll be cons we're doing kind of a final piece of rulemaking to clean up all the other. Hopefully not final. I shouldn't say that, but we'll be doing a second round of rulemaking for all the appliance standards for some things that we're dangling, um, and we're going to be including um, a proposal to push this back six months. Um, and then finally, kind of the most important part, right, is that this standard requires the CTA 2045 communication port um, that Ashley kind of talks through. Um, we also have language that says or equivalent standards that could be considered as well. And so the process for that um, is still kind of being fleshed out. It's uh, in, in rule, but it's, um, we haven't actually used the process. So currently, the only standard in Washington is CTA 2045. There is a process by which a manufacturer um, could propose a, an equivalent standard, and it would have to go through a public vetting process and technical review. So still, you know, um, that's still an option, and it does provide flexibility, but, um, you know, it was a kind of, it was a very important point of conversation in our rulemaking. Okay, if we go to the next slide. So I think a lot of this has actually already been said, so I'm gonna move this through this a bit quickly and maybe pick out the ones that are Washington specific, right? So this is a technology that supports this grid of the future and flexible load management. Um, it supports, you know, commerce is supportive of modular open standards, which are both good for consumers, but also allow innovation. So I think those two points have been made pretty well. Um, you know, I will say that uh, and I'll speak a little bit about more of this on the next slide, but the technical and behavioral data from the pilot that Ashley mentioned was such a critical piece of this getting included. Um, really having the data, and I think this is true as we move towards um, trying to think through the kind of regulatory barriers around emerging technologies related to demand response and storage, to be honest as well, um, having pilot data is, is really impactful. So this is a huge reason um, that we were able to, to lead on this. And we spoke to that support in a CEC docket on load management. I mean, the other big piece of this is that we just passed, in the same year we passed the Appliance Standards Bill and the Clean Building Standard, we also passed the Clean Energy Transformation Act. So 2019 being a pretty banner year for clean energy in Washington. And, you know, in addition, to the kind of 100% clean standards, so 100% clean energy by 2045, um, with some interim targets in there. There's also a lot more work to think about demand response targets as well. And there's an increasing conversation around, um, you know, the capacity market that I think many hope will someday sort of um, come together up in the Pacific Northwest, but will really be kind of this background, you know, pushing forward these these technologies. But you know, in general, this kind of technology really does support the policy vision um, of the Clean Energy Transformation Act. And so, you know, it was all kind of a package of ideas. And just to go a little step further on that too, I'll say that um, that suite of bills came out of a deep decarbonization pathways study by E3, and it was this really strategic work done by the governor. We are currently in the process of doing um, a state energy strategy update for Washington as part of Clean Energy Transformation Act, where we're kind of redoing that modeling um, and just try to envision, you know, what's happening. So, um, you know, my hope is that, again, flexible load management tools are going to be a big part of that conversation. Okay, so if we go to the next slide. So, right, so maybe some more specifics about how this actually came into play. So uh, the legislature, and actually the state standards in general, had been supported by uh, Representative Jeff Morris um, since the early days. So really the champion in our state for state standards, and again came um, you know, to, to sponsor this bill, this agency request legislation that we had. So we worked very closely in getting this passed, and he was particularly um, passionate about making sure that this great connected water heater standard was part of this bill, because you know, it is new and Washington is not used to playing in that kind of leadership role. So I think it was, there was times when it was kind of the conversation was, oh, is it too hard to do this? And we're doing too much or why are we doing too much? I don't know. So it really took leadership from um, Rhett Morris to help us make sure to, you know, keep moving forward and also have like a very technically minded representative be able to speak to the merits of this technology. 
And as I mentioned again, so the data from the Bonneville Power Administration, Portland General Electric, and Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance from that, that pilot were so critical. And beyond that, having those folks available, so um, um, Conrad Eustis from, you know, formerly of PTE, came and spoke with Brett Morris and our team, you know, before the session started to really understand the, the deep technical issues behind this. We had folks that were able to come and really give us a um, help speak to legislators about uh, legislators about this new technology that many were not familiar with. So again, having a broad base is really important. Um, and then also we had a nice diverse support as well. So not only did we have our technical experts um, that I just mentioned above, but we had, you know, we had some utilities that are kind of poking around demand response and interested, as well as environmental advocates. Um, so the North Northwest Energy Coalition, um, who's a very active player in our in our kind of our regional work with the Northwest Power Council, um, came and, and supported um, as, as well as, as folks from the Northwest Power Council. <laughs> so just having this kind of this regional um, technical expertise was incredibly important and helped um, us convince people that should be in the bill and provide that those kind of that technical background. So if we go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the, the okay, we got it done, which was great, and, um, but you know, it was our first time out, so there was a lot of learning moments for sure, and I'm happy to speak. If folks have questions about this, you know, um, dig in more on this, I'm kind of just going to breeze through a little bit right now, um, but again, getting broad technical support is key, but let me also mention it's available, so, you know, there is work on a national scale to make sure that um, you know, that to, to try to think through how to harmonize these uh, codes and standards. So, you know, if please reach out to me, um, you know, if you're interested in trying to get connected to folks that can really help you kind of start understanding those technical pieces. Um, I also, I also really appreciated and thought that it was well appreciated the, the vocal support from the utilities. Um, I think demand response and flexible load management has like a very different uh, sound and flavor, depending on where you're at, our, you know, the country. Um, currently, right now, we, it's not, it is a really interesting conversation, and I think the Clean Energy Transformation Act is definitely pushing it forward, but maybe there's not as many utilities, like, explicitly pursuing a demand response program, um, but we were able to work with a couple, including um, Clark Pewdy and Nahomish Pewdy, so two of our publics. Um, we're really able to come in and speak to why this would be important technology for them and why they're why they're thinking about pursuing this work. So that was a really great um, and Snohomish um, actually they um, came out in favor of the bill. Clark did not, but they were part of the um, rulemaking process. Excuse me, and were able to provide good insight during that process, which I was really appreciative of. Um, and you know, uh, you know, Abigail said this at the end of hers, kind of, and I, it was actually really interesting. And I don't want to follow up with her, but um, one of the biggest things that came out in floor debate and in committee was fears around cybersecurity and other consumer protection issues. And, you know, I think the idea of kind of the, a utility or a, an aggregate or somebody having access to, you know, your home or parts that, you know, or your water heater um, definitely um, is unsettling for folks in our state. Um, you know, and I think other technologies have met with similar barriers, specifically advanced metering infrastructure in our in Washington is, um, you know, we just we don't have a very high penetration of it. And a lot of it, um, from what I understand, stems from fears around kind of consumer protection and cybersecurity. So we actually worked with um, a Republican uh, representative and got sort of a little a piece of language in there um, to kind of hopefully assuage some of those fears. But I, I will say on the floor of the, the floor debate, this came out quite a bit. Um, and also for Washington State, all of our um, committees are recorded, so you can watch all this stuff, and it's very instructive to hear people talk about it. So again, if you're wanting to find those resources, I can help you find them. Um, the other kind of big learning lesson for us was around considering adding flexibility through this or equivalent language. And I, go, I have gone back and forth on whether I think this was the right thing to do or not. I think I have ended up that having the or equivalent language 
is a good thing. Um, you know, one way it would be nice just to have like the CTA 2045 standard and that's it and let's call it and everyone else do the same thing. But, you know, again, this is an emerging field. So um, providing some space for something that can still do like the shed, you know, the, the different commands like shed um, or stop, you know, those kinds of things would be would be equivalent. So, you know, if there's a better way to do it, if there's a better um, idea out there, we definitely want to provide the space for that. So um, in our language, it says CTA 2045 or equivalent. So that just provides that space. Um, and then finally, especially for state agencies that maybe don't have, that are not the agency that does appliances, um, you know, just considering your in-house technical needs, both for, both to explain the, the, the standard during the legislative session, but also for implementation after is really critical. So again, I, it's me and I, you know, I do appliances a third of the time, you know, and we also have another, um, uh, our, uh, that does buildings has done appliances forever too, but you know, it's very consumed with the clean building standard and it's, it, we're just, we don't have that technical capacity. And so, I mean, my job would be impossible were it not for all that technical support I mentioned. So, you know, just understanding, you know, who's going to be your champion. Um, I know for some states too, there's kind of a split governance around appliances. Maybe they don't have one home. So really trying to figure out who's going to be in the lead, who's going to be figuring this out um, is really going to be important. Um, and again, for states that are contemplating this, um, I've gotten a lot of experience walking through this <laughs> this work. So I am happy to sit down and talk to you about it. You know, um, actually also mentioned that Oregon through executive order has included um, this standard, which is very exciting. California doing some work. But, you know, I think that the more of us that can do that, the better. And it'll just really strengthen this conversation around open standards for flexible load management and large load. Um, and then I think with that, might be done. Go to the next slide. Yep, so that's it. That's all for me. Um, I really breezed through a lot, kind of touching on some high points there, but, you know, happy to dive into specifics and um, connect with folks offline to provide resources. So with that, I will stop talking. Thank you so much, Sarah. That, that, that was wonderful. And, and, and the three of you have done a great job in, in complimenting each other on this work. Uh, soon I will hand this over to Ed to check on the questions and we do have quite a number and I apologize if we don't get to all of them, but I will take the prerogative of, of asking uh, the first question, which is uh, pretty broad and, and this is for all the panelists from their perspectives. What do you view as sort of the key barriers to implementing uh, grid interactive functionality, whether in water heaters, or devices generally, and, and perhaps to comment on whether the main impediments are, are technical or, or more policy regulatory in nature. And uh, what, what are the steps that states can uh, take to address those? Just an easy question to start with. Um, well, I'm happy to just give, a, give that a whack and, and then pass it on to others for kind of the more technical pieces. But, you know, I think it's what I was just saying here at the end, um, the, the sort of the highly technical nature of this conversation, especially when you're coming down to the, the different parts of like CTA 2045 with your physical form and then also the um, kind of the software and, and signals and stuff that are just, it's, it's, there's a lot of pieces and there's a lot of, you know, differences between things like open ADR and CTA 2045 and, you know, all the cybersecurity um, kind of fears uh, that are very real. So I just think, um, I, I think one of the biggest barriers to me, I feel like to me, and again, not being a technical expert, I could be wrong about this, but to me, it seems that the, the technology is there. Um, and like with so many of these standards, it's just really about knowing when to lock it in through a legislative action. So you know, I think the more pilots and the more um, data that we can get to explain how these work um, and also, uh, you know, showing their impact on consumers or lack thereof is such a big thing. And I love the way um, Abigail really laid out these, you know, the kinds of the different taxonomies of, of um, possibly grid connected devices, because I do think people are like, oh, people are going to get not have hot water, you know, and that's a valid concern if you don't 
you're not used to interacting with your water heater, right? Or having someone else interact with it. So just, um, you know, the barriers being kind of that technical piece and then being overcome by more data and, and technical people to explain it in a kind of jargon-free, high-level way to legislators. This is Abby. I'd like to jump in on that question. So to um, pick up the thread where uh, Sarah had left it, I don't disagree with anything she said. On the technical piece, from my perspective, I feel like um, it's not so much that all the technology is there, but it's all really close. All the pieces are lying around. And as an engineering problem, it's not at all insurmountable. But uh, one of the reasons that the unfamiliarity becomes an issue is because the decision makers around the various different things you have to decide about here are from different worlds. You have the utility and utility regulators, and you have the appliance manufacturers as an example of two groups. And they are absolutely used to working together on energy efficiency. But as it turns out, the load management and planning folks at the utilities are not at, not the same people. And so there's a fair amount of trying to all learn to speak each other's language and understand what's important to each of the various important decision makers to come up with a coordinated solution that really provides value broadly. The other thing I'll mention is that right now in most places, um, so the, the consumer value of being able to control when they use energy, there, there just isn't a lot of consumer value there. Our, rate, our utility rate structures and various programs, it's not natural. There's a little of a Frankenstein feel to demand response programs. And, uh, and I hope that this is not an insult to those who have done the hard work and the good work of putting them together and running them all these years, but it's not like, oh, you know, this is the cheaper brand, so I'll buy the cheaper product and I know I'll get the same performance. And there's not that kind of straightforward and simple relationship in most places. So I think that the states and utilities that are uh, breaking new ground in terms of time of use rates and a variety of other um, mechanisms for bringing the value that the utility gets from flattening load to bring some of that to the consumer can really make a big difference. Of course, here I am speaking from a consumer information brand, of course, so. <laughs> but I would add that in. Yeah, and I guess I'll piggyback off Abby. Um, I think from a manu manufacturer's perspective, one of the key things that Abby just touched on in terms of education and explaining to them um, why they should pay more up front for this sophisticated water heater that's going to do all this stuff behind the scenes um, is at first a hard sell and unless they are, understand exactly what it's doing for them or there's some pathway through utility pricing structures that they can be made whole and you can show them that and and like abby noted that that infrastructure just doesn't exist throughout most of the country right now um, so education is definitely a big one I would agree that the technical um, aspects are there, although I would say there's a variety of different pathways we can all do it. So at coalescing around uniform standards, coalescing around similar methods, um, I think that will help drive some of this in terms of a market transformation. And, and that's really where um, Sarah standing up the first set of standards with the CTA 2045 port um, that's where this is starting to head, although there's still a lot of work to, to go. Great, thank you. Um, Ed, uh, could you take over the questions? I believe we have quite a few uh, that have been su uh, submitted. You bet. Um, so we do have quite a few questions. So our first question is, uh, Customer, so customers, utilities, and third-party data providers may have aligned interests for grid value, but have divergent interests for the related data. To what degree is the SHEMS framework considering the data management aspects of connected energy products? Who owns the data and provisions for data access, data quality, cybersecurity, and consumer protection? And that came in during Abby's presentation, so I'm going to... Uh, 
point that one to her, but I think we can let anyone who wants to jump in. Yeah, I'll answer specifically for the Smart Home Energy Management Shem specification. Um, so I did address the uh, data privacy and security. Um, I will say that our general attitude is that the best use of energy data comes when it's broadly available. If consumers are able to assign that data or give third parties access to that data. So I would not want it to be exclusively the, um, the property of the smart home systems uh, provider. That being said, uh, it's not really within our authority to legislate that. In terms of data quality, um, we do have a role there. So we can uh, define, for instance, in terms of, um, I mentioned that we require various products to report their energy consumption. We have not to date defined uh, what that looks like, but we could. Similarly for um, smart thermostats where we have uh, significant influence in the market at this point, we could have a uniform data um, or information model for how smart thermostat data is reported. We haven't done that yet. I'm not sure. Right now, uh, back to a point that Sarah made, you have to be very careful about when you um, ask for uniformity because you don't want to lock out um, innovation. And the use of that data to unlock further value for consumers, manufacturers, and utilities is something that we expect the private sector to innovate about um, really effectively. And so we don't want to, we, we see ourselves as more rewarding in, in innovation than uh, locking down particular technical solutions. So um, I, I will say that I think uh, the Communication standards for load shifting, demand response, uh, load control, that's a little bit of a different case in terms of standardization. So that's another thread though, and I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ashley or Sarah, do either of y'all wanna jump in with anything? No, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Um, another uh, quick question for Abby. Um, in control, in the controllability with smart home technology, is the opt out of a DR event part of the requirements? Yes, it is. Um, all of our specifications that include demand response require that the product provide a easy opt out option. In other words, you don't have to call your utility to opt out. You could just press a button or on the app or something like that to opt out easily. Um, now, it may be that not all utilities use that feature. Uh, in my discussions with utilities, the vast majority of them have indicated that they see consumer override as an important capability. So our role is to help make sure that's easy. So one of the advantages of doing DR with connected appliances is unlike in the days of load control switches where you had to call the utility to override, it should be easy. There's no reason it shouldn't be easy. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try and get some questions for some other folks. So, um, for Ashley, is there a risk for Legionella growth if the water heater is off for an extended period of time? Um, so I think there's still a lot of work in that area that's going to be done, but I would say right now in the current um, way our water heaters are both programmed as well as um, if it dips below a specific delta T, it's going to start reheating to make sure both that it's safe for operational, but also it's ready to meet consumer demand. So the growth of Legionelle is not an issue with our water heaters as they exist today. Um. 
Um, I've got another question. Um, would the three presenters please comment on how they justify the cost effectiveness of enabled appliances and the consumer has control whether to take a shift or a shed command? Cost effectiveness in flexible demand is a different dynamic than that used for energy efficiency standards. Um, this is Abby. I can answer for our part uh, because we do we do look for uh, criteria that are cost effective. Because these criteria are optional for Energy Star, most Energy Star products, including water heaters, um, we do not actually check for cost effectiveness for this. The assumption is that people won't buy it unless it's worth their while, or unless some third party, you know, a utility, for instance, makes it worth their while. Yeah, I was going to say, um, just to piggyback off of Abby's answer, um, it's very, it's going to be very zip code specific, depending on what your utility pricing structure looks like and what your utility program, either rebate or incentive structure looks like for signing up. Um, it can be done a variety of different ways through um, real-time pricing or others, but, but that value proposition varies greatly depending on which local utility you're in. I would just mention that, I mean, I think for a state adopting standards, you know, the hope is that by adopting that standard, you're going to have more products available. Um, and so the price will go down. And actually, um, the BPA study, the BPA PGE um, water uh, heater pilot study does a really nice job walking through the um, kind of decrease in marginal cost. Um, over, over a period of different adoption rates. So I might take a look at that as well. I, I do not have it uh, locked in my brain because it's not the 2019 legislative session, but they did a really nice job of thinking through the answer, I think, to that question as well. Um, so I've got another question that just came in. Um, so, uh, just going to read the question. Maybe a question for Sarah, but open to anyone. Do you have any suggestions about arguments or or data? At, oh, okay. Sorry. Do you have any suggestions about arguments or data that advocates can use to convince utility regulators and or utilities to run DR pilots, especially for water heaters? <clears throat> What a what a very good question that is, <laughs> and I wish I had a really great answer for you. Um, I think it actually brings up a really important point, which is just because you pass a grid connected water heater standard in your state does not mean that DR programs are going to follow. So there is very intentional work that needs to be done, uh, especially on the regulatory side, to understand to see the full value stacking that DR and you know other kind of load management tools bring. Um, and I think, you know, for me, what I see as we're asking utilities in our state to set targets for demand response as part of their clean energy implementation plans under our new clean energy law, um, you know, it's that potential assessment is going to be, a uh, demand response potential assessment is going to be really key, but also, you know, adopting what we've learned um, in terms of energy efficiency for DR as well, which is really different. There's just very different needs, I think, and understanding what those are. So unfortunately, I'm just telling you barriers, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I, I think that the, the, honestly, the BPA PGE pilot is a great piece to help you at least get some numbers around things and provide value. Um, I think you could also take a look at the Northwest Power and Conservation Council has something called the Demand Response Advisory Committee, and they're right now trying to do some modeling around um, what demand response, you know, demand response supply curves and different bins of cost for demand response, including a water heater, um, you know, so that is a really useful thing to look at. And then finally, I believe uh, the Na National Renewable Energy Lab has a tool called Scout um, that I'm actually hoping to learn about more soon um, that is like a demand response modeling tool. So we have some tools we're building out there, but others might have better, uh, some other good suge suggestions as well. The only other thing that I'll add to that is before the Pacific Northwest study, um, 
Natural Resources Defense Council, with the support of the CEC, did a very nice uh, combination of labs, lab um, measurement and then a uh, simulation model showing the value of a fleet of grid-connected heat pump water heaters as well as electric resistance to um, to prevent the spilling of renewables or limit the spilling of renewables in the California grid. Um, that uh, that's that is available at NRDC's website. The author is Pierre Del Forge. Right. Yeah, and there's a comment in the questions that um, new analysis from the Northwest Power and Conservation Council shows that grid managed electric water heaters can be the largest single regional demand response source with a potential up to several hundred megawatts. Um, Thank you for that, whoever put that in the comments. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm trying to wade through these questions here. Um, so here's a question. How do demand response standards interact with federal standards preemption law? Is it consistent across all appliance and equipment types? Typically, they don't. Though I don't, so for water heaters in specific, it's interesting that there's a um, there's a type of separately regulated water heater. Um, Ashley, you know a lot about this also. That's a, a grid interactive water heater or something like that, and that is a different beast. That is allowing a um, less efficient water heater in certain size classes. Uh, if the water heater is specifically designed that its full capabilities aren't available until it's part of a uh, load management program. Aside from that, mostly this is talking about capabilities that are provided in addition to whatever product the product typically provides, and they do not make the product take more energy than the federal standards require. And so the, the federal energy efficiency standards don't come into play. Now, what it would mean if federal uh, technical standards for demand response came in, I couldn't say. Yeah, I, I think it's just safe to say that, it's, that that's still an open question, right? That we're just embarking on the first state that has kind of grid-enabled water heater standards. Um, and, and so I, I don't think that question has really fully been answered um, and, it, and it's still kind of open-ended. And fortunately you don't have um, lawyers on the phone. So I think that's about all we can say on it. All right, thank you. Um, another quick question for Abby. Um, will all appliances be controlled through one platform or each? will each have their own dashboard? Um, I'm not sure what the context for that question is. Um, in the context of the Energy Star Shems program, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make it so that um, it is possible for a set of common and energy relevant devices such as um, lighting, plug loads, uh, and thermostats to be controlled through a single interface. Um, for consumer convenience. And that's part of what we're trying to achieve with the SHEMS platform. Um, they may also have their own parallel individual interfaces. We have not tried to prevent that in any way, but um, in terms of demand response, whether they'd be controlled by a single interface, I can't say, but um, for the large loads, we are attempting to make it easier for that to develop by having common criteria across several different significant product categories. For instance, uh, we specify what signal you would use for off-mode or grid emergency, the kind of thing you'd use to prevent a blackout for water heaters. And it's the same signal you'd use, in, is, for instance, in CTA 2045, there's a signal for that in water heaters. There's also the same signal for that in um, 
for uh, uh, heating and cooling equipment, the same signal for uh, electric vehicle chargers. We haven't, you know, has been proposed. So um, that doesn't require that the same platform uh, control them all, but hopefully it'll make it easier for the same platform to control them all and for that to be something that's more broadly available than from a DR aggregator that has done a tremendous amount of work to make it happen. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, question, how are uh, interruption and control on off variable um, product power draws, what is their effect on product warranties, maintenance imp impacts, et cetera? Um, how do you consider that when setting standards with interoperability? Ashley, you want to take the first crack? Uh, sure. I mean, I'll set the, uh, I'll take the cycling type question, I guess. So right now our um, smart water heaters are offered with comparable uh, warranties to our non-smart water heaters. I mean, we found no issues in terms of um, reliability type concerns that would impact warranty with them functioning in smart or load manage mode or DR mode. From the EPA perspective, part of the sort of standard thing we include in our connected criteria is that the manufacturer retains um, the essentially retains control of the product so if a and retains um, responsibility for that product being operated safely and being operated in such a way as to maintain its useful life and so if uh, the expectation is explicit that if a command comes in, which is a safety concern, for instance, on a gas dryer or a gas water heater, that the product would not respond. You know, we're calling them commands, but I just want to point out they're actually grid requests. If a request comes in that the product can't safely uh, respond to or can't respond to without damage to itself, then the expectation is that the product would not respond to that request. Right, or if it's in the middle of doing something and a grid request comes in, it might stage it such that it's finished what it's actually doing, and then it will start executing the grid request afterwards to ensure safe operation. That's another one example. Thank you. Uh, Rodney, do you see any of these remaining questions that you want to address? I think we handled most of them or all of them. If if not, we can look again. It's, it's a little hard to scroll through this. I do uh, want to make a note uh, that, uh, Sarah, we would like to take you up on your offer and Ashley and Abby, if you want to participate as well, to invite other states that are interested in pursuing this further to, to discuss you know, what states can do. And I'm aware that our uh, friends and colleagues at the Appliance Standards Awareness Project are participating in the audience and uh, we collaborate with them. So it's a suggestion for us and ASAP and Sarah and whoever else is interested to uh, assemble in the future to uh, explore next steps and uh, lessons learned in a more detailed ma manner. That would be great. I would really appreciate doing that. And in the meantime, again, please, anyone be in touch. Uh, I think Nazio has all of our contacts. So We know where you live, <laughs> so to speak. All right. So I, I did have, there's one more question I want to bring up. Um, we'll do it as sort of a lightning round since we have five minutes left. Um, the question was, uh, can you speak more to the choice between adopting CTA 2045 versus open ADR communication and why you went with CTA 2045? Um, that's a good and complicated question. And so I'll just quickly say <laughs> that there are some very uh, important technical differences between those two and about um, kind of 
what they actually do. And so I don't, they're, it's kind of like a squares rectangles thing from best I understand. We went with CTA 2045 after a lot of really smart people that have worked on these standards for a long time helped us understand that was the best, uh, you know, standard for this water heater, uh, you know, design requirement that we are looking at. But I think Ashley and Abigail can probably help us a little bit more on that. Yeah, I'll just chime in with saying um, CTA 2045 and open ADR aren't mutually exclusive. In other words, you don't have to pick one or the other. Um, CTA 2045 requires or has two components to it. One is a hardware component, which like is a physical piece of hardware that you would put on your appliance. It could be a water heater, but it can also be used for other appliances. Um, it's similar to like a USB-C requirement. It's just talking about the physical connector and what it looks like. Um, it also has what I would call a software and application component, which talks through what type of commands and, and basically the language that the utility is using to speak to the water heater. Um, Open ADR just talks about how you talk through with the utilities via the cloud. So you can technically be like, our heaters can be CTO, CTA 2045 compliant and use open ADR for cloud-based communication. So you can be both and you don't have to pick one or the other, but they do do different things. Um, so it really just depends on how the utility or the states are situated in terms of what they might want. What's important to us is that things start to coalesce around one set of requirements, whether that be the communication protocols that are going to be used. So what commands the water heater can expect to have to execute, as well as the hardware that we would need to use to talk to the utility or either a consumer facing app. Abby, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I'll say a little more. Um, so uh, first of all, let me say this landscape is changing. The, the, the unique advantage of CTA 2045 is that it is specifically designed so that if um, conditions change and a homeowner used to be signed up with a program for one utility or one kind of program that used one communication protocol and they want to change to a different communication protocol, it can be as easy, it's designed so that it can be as easy as the utility mails them uh, a small box, they take out the box, they pull, a, it's not like a USB, but it's it's kind of similar that you pull out one USB device and you put in a different one and then you register your new device and you're done. So that's the vision. I don't know how close we are to actually achieving that vision. So that's really the unique advantage of CTA 2045. The unique advantage of open ADR, which for our large loads, most of them uh, allow either one of those or both uh, protocol. The unique advantage of open ADR is that if there's already a communication pathway to the device, like for user, for user uh, uh, services or for a manufacturer to have uh, understand how the device is used, then you only have to do programming in the cloud to implement open ADR. And that provides a, a uniform protocol that utilities can use to talk cloud to cloud from their cloud to the other cloud, the service provider's cloud, to get a DR response. So it kind of depends on what you want to protect yourself from or what you want that to be easier. You know, do you want to future proof or do you want to play around with something right now? Um, I will say that for water heaters, um, the, it is more clear to me that CTA 2045 is an excellent technical solution. For some other products, it is less clear that that's true. And so we've maintained both criteria, both open ADR and CTA 2045 for grid communications for a variety of our products, but it depends on the product type. And for water heaters specifically, I think there is a stronger argument for CTA 2045. Great, well, thank you all. That was, I wanted to bring that question up because I think I had a similar question. Uh, when uh, when I was first learning about the, all these technologies. But um, Rod, I'll, I'll hand it off to you to wrap us up. 
Sure, uh, but let, let me throw one more in there, uh, recognizing that we're at the end of the hour and a half, but I did want to throw in uh, asking views on whether traditional energy efficiency rebate and incentive programs ought to be modernized and aimed at uh, grid interactive uh, functionality. So, so maybe quickly some views on that, and and that's a bit different from a you know a DR incentive, but whether rebates and and uh, you know those sorts of incentives on products ought to consider uh, these sorts of capabilities. Well, I'll go first. I think it's pretty obvious that we we would support that, and we do support that today. Um, we're starting to see. And I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I mean, to the extent that there can still be rebates for energy efficiency, but perhaps layered on top, you could have additional rebates um, or incremental rebates for uh, smart technologies or load managed technologies. And one of the main drivers for that is you're trying to get the consumer to purchase a different piece of equipment than they're otherwise used to. And, and by that, I mean, one of the biggest values is um, perhaps larger storage capacity. So you have larger thermal, basically a larger thermal battery. And if you want a consumer to buy a larger water heater than they otherwise typically would buy, then maybe you need an additional program offset um, to help influence their purchasing decision upfront. This is Abby, I'll jump in. Um... There's, there is and will always be a place for energy efficiency. Let me just be super clear about that. The, um, the answer is very uh, location specific. If controlling when energy is used provides a value in the particular location and uh, helps achieve the traditional aims of energy efficiency incentive programs, then like do, for instance, using less carbon, then absolutely. Great. Sarah, did you um, have a view? Although you, you're you're requiring it on uh, water heaters, but um, in, in terms of perhaps right. other products. Yeah, I think I'd actually agree with what was just said. You know, I think it's a great tool. Um, I think I always hesitate a little to just, you know, one-to-one -one map on everything we did for EE um, onto DR. So I'd want to, like, um, understand from an aggregator or from a person kind of doing the research what the best way to achieve the benefits of demand response would be, though I certainly see an opportunity for um, rebates and incentives, especially since we've been very successful at that in the Pacific Northwest, and I would hope to continue kind of the, the relationships between people, because like BPA, Bonneville Power Administration does a lot of this work for their um, utilities, and I'm hoping that the same kind of work will be done for demand response, and so I could see that being a really effective tool. But there is still okay. opportunity for energy efficiency. I want to uh, highlight that as well, what Abby said, and that's always an important first step. Yeah, and we would agree with that too. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all again for, uh, for, for being with us and uh, sharing these great uh, presentations. And again, the invitation out to the states to get in touch with us, to continue the conversation and move the ball forward. And uh, thank you all again. Have a great rest of the day. And uh, we're planning our next uh, webinar. Uh, not quite sure exactly what it will be, but stay tuned. And uh, again, these will be posted on the uh, NASIO website as well as on the GEP Working Group uh, sub website. So thank you all and have a great day. Bye now. Thanks for having us. Bye. Yeah, thank you guys. Take care. Take care.